Hi everyone. Hope you had a great week and uh, I'm certainly looking forward to the next two weeks because I don't need to go anywhere. I can self-isolate. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. Some of us don't have to go to work for the next two weeks. Look, I hope you're all well and um, uh, we're certainly um, enjoying things up here. We had um, some family members around yesterday and uh, we also caught up with some of our family on Thursday, which was really great. So, um, um, you know, well, we are so thrilled that God has watched over us and uh, um, taken care of, of all of our needs. So I just hope the same for all of you. So let's just begin by bowing our heads and I'll ask God in prayer. Great eternal God, we come before you realizing that we're so privileged to know you. We're privileged to be called out to understand your plan, your good news, and privileged just to have that extra help that we know that is so special and that those who don't know you, don't want to know you, they do not know that what they're missing out on. So we do thank you for this time together. It's a time of sharing. And we ask that you will be here to guide the, the messages and the worship and our participation. So we leave this uh, time in your hands and thank you for it. In Jesus Christ's precious name, amen. amen. Now, uh, Rex is going to do the announcements. Okay, let's get started. Greetings to you all. Uh, good to see you here. We've got quite a few people from around the country with us today. Up north there, North Auckland, uh, Avon, on down to, um, down to Queenstown there with um, Bert and, and Nolene. So, yeah, and, and uh, Trish, Trish is representing Australia. So great to see you guys. Um, greetings to those who will be watching later as well. Uh, on YouTube. Uh, that'll include the ones in Vanuatu, um, William and Carmen and Lindy. So hello to you because I know you'll be watching this at some stage. So this is our first uh, Sunday of the month service that replaces our physical service for this weekend. And this is what we'll be doing the first weekend of every month until the end of the year when uh, that'll be reviewed. If at any time you've got friends or relatives that you'd like to come, who would like to come to a GCI service, uh, feel free to invite them. Uh, being the first Sunday of every month, that's uh, easy to remember. Well, I hope everyone's getting through the winter okay. Uh, I noticed there's a bit of snow and uh, rain around, not here at the moment in Auckland, but different parts of the country. It can be quite cold this time of the year. Uh, they keep promising us rain in Auckland. We'd like to have some. They say we're going to have some in the next day or two, so uh, we, we're hoping for that. Uh, very few announcements this week. Just one announcement here for young people, ages 18 to 30, that a team of young adult leaders in the United States has planned a virtual C, a GCI Ignite, GCI Ignite, a gathering to be held on Zoom between July the 24th and August the 1st. So in about a month's time, or at the end of this month, all young adults in GCI aged between 18 to 30 from anywhere in the world are welcome to join this. And that'll be really great for, for those uh, young people to meet together in that way. It's a bit tricky times, time zones and all over the world meeting together. I think it's in the morning in the States and in the evening here. Uh, but somehow they've worked that out. And we do have uh, the details of that if anyone needs them. But we've got the details of all the meeting, meeting times and dates. Uh, just a few prayer updates and that'll be it for today's announcements. I noticed that a few, a few of the people we've been praying for have now left hospital, including Sue Wood, down there in Invercargill, um, Barbara Rogers, Dan Rogers' wife there in the States, uh, Sandra Joy's daughter-in-law, 
Um, and of course, Margaret Hammond, we actually have her in our service today. So all of those people have been, have left, been discharged now from hospital, but all of them still need our, need our prayers. And so do continue to remember them. And we just have one new prayer request today uh, that uh, came across from Africa, actually. Our superintendent, Kalingule, there in Africa, he mentioned that his wife, Nsama, has a serious health issue and is being hospitalized for treatment. So please remember Nsama in our prayers. She's very involved in the ministry there. So uh, that is a new uh, prayer request. And I don't have any others to hand, but uh, several others that we are praying for. And it's good to see that some of them are now out of hospital. So that's all I have for the announcements today. Right, the reading today is from Matthew chapter 6, and verses 21 to 34, and this one's from the message version. It's obvious, isn't it? The place where your treasure is, is the place you will most want to be and end up being. Your eyes are windows into your body. If you open your eyes wide in wonder and belief, your body fills up with light. If you live squinty-eyed in greed and in distrust, your body is a dank cellar. If you pull the blinds on your windows, what a dark life you will have. You can't worship two gods at once. Loving one, you'll end up hating the other. Adoring the one feeds contempt for the other. You can't worship God and money both. If you decide for God, living a life of God worship, it follows that you don't fuss about what's on the table at meal times or whether the clothes on your closet in your closet are in fashion. 
There is far more to your life than the food you put in your stomach, more to your outer appearance than the clothes you hang on your body. Look at the birds, free and unfettered, do not tied down to a job description, careless in the care of God. And you count for more to him than birds. Has anyone by fussing in front of a mirror, mirror ever gotten taller by so much as an inch? All this time and money wasted on fashion. Do you think it makes that much difference? Instead of looking at the fashions, walk out into the fields and look at the wildflowers. They never pimp or shop. But have you ever seen colour and design quite like it? The 10 best dressed men and women in the country look shabby alongside them. If God gives such attention to the appearance of wildflowers, most of whom are never even seen, don't you think he will attend to you, take pride in you, do his best for you? What I'm, what I'm trying to do here is to get you to relax, to not be so preoccupied with getting so you can respond to God's giving. People who don't know God and the way he works fuss over these things, but you know both God and how he works. Steep your life in God's reality, God's initiative, God's provision. Don't worry about messing, uh, missing out. You'll find out, uh, find out all your everyday human concerns will be met. Give your entire attention to what God is doing right now and don't be worked up about what may or may not happen tomorrow. God will help you deal with whatever hard things come up when the time comes. As we get older, it's natural to start thinking of and preparing for our passing on. And this week, Sue and I updated our wills. The older ones, you see, were just long out of date. The point of doing this is to make our wishes known when we no longer can do that for ourselves. And while we can prepare for what follows, we truly can't entirely control it. But we can prepare. And a church is no different. And I've been pondering the what and how of passing the baton of opportunity and responsibility to the generation coming along after us. And thankfully, we have a few young people with whom to work, and they too then will be able to go out into the field as we did before them, to do some telling and sowing and weeding, watering and reaping of the great harvest, where quite frankly, Jesus is already and has long been at work, and we just simply join him there. Appropriately, I think, Peter Lindop read to us from the message paraphrase of Jesus' teaching in Matthew 6, where he says, where your treasure is, there is your heart also, in verse 21. But the lesson doesn't stop with just that. Peterson goes on to say, in verses 22 and 23, your eyes are windows into your body. If you open your eyes wide in wonder and belief, your body fills up with light. If you live squinty-eyed in greed and distrust, your body is a dank cellar. If you pull the blinds on your windows, what a dark life you will have. Which poses the question for us, of course, where are our eyes directed? Are they directed within or are they directed beyond? And what is our treasure? Now, I think any older person can tell you what our treasure is. That's our legacy. That's our children. That's our truest treasure. The generations that follow us those upon whom we do actually exert by word, lifestyle and generosity, a considerable influence, whether of course that's good or bad, I hope it's for good. And by so doing, we are preparing like David did for Solomon, for them to take their place, do their part and pass the baton on further still. I remember my father sitting in his hospital bed a day or two before he died, with some of his grandchildren standing at the foot of his bed. It was just him and them. I was in the next room. I kind of was watching and certainly was listening. Anyway, he took a moment to lay the gospel on them. 
And he reminded them of the wonderful future God has prepared for them. And he reassured them that God is always good for his promises. Surely he knew that his time was short. And so he was speaking with passion and intensity. And some of you will remember uh, he was uh, at intense, very intense sometimes. And I remember it because that's the way he spoke to me on a number of occasions when I was younger. And so he was pointing them, as he earlier had pointed me, to the high calling that we have in Christ Jesus. Appropriately, I think also, uh, one of the readings for today is Psalm 45, which at the end says this, Your sons will take the place of your fathers. You will make them princes throughout the land. I will perpetuate your memory through all generations. Therefore, the nations will praise you forever and ever. And to me, that's speaking of doing something active for those that follow it, setting them up and launching them forward. And so what we pass on to them is essential. It's the thing of greatest importance. And for that reason, I've been pondering how to encourage, equip, and enable the young members of our church, and in Masterton particularly, for the future through training and mentoring. For as it says in Proverbs 13, verse 22, a good person leaves an inheritance for their children's children. Or as the message has it, a good life gets passed on to the grandchildren. Now, the NIV version seems to me to imply an intentional work towards passing on a worthy legacy, whereas the message implies instead a reflecting of one's own nature and heart so that the legacy is used to the full in a godly manner. And both of those things, on both of those aspects, I think, and approaches are, are, are valid and, and good. So what are we passing on down? Well, another part, way of putting that, of course, is what's our vision? What's our vision for them? If they truly are our treasure, the fruit of our heart, then our greatest desire will be to see them join in Jesus in the work in his field. And vision, and here I paraphrase something from the word for today, uh, two or three weeks back, can be described in four different elements. It is first God-given, Second, it draws upon our story. Thirdly, it meets the needs of others. And lastly, it commands our resources, which is to say that it is important, it is treasured, and it is a deeply person-focused, value-based, and rational um, passing on of the things that we have to them. The prioritizing of, of encouraging and helping young members of the church to grow up strong in Christ Jesus is for me a clear and pressing element of the vision we have for the church in this part of the world. For it is central to the very last words of the Old Testament. And I think those words point clearly to what the point is in the New Testament, where you read in Malachi chapter 4, verses 5 and 6, Look, I am sending you the prophet Elijah before the great and dreadful day of the Lord. His preaching will turn the hearts of fathers to their children, and the hearts of children to their fathers. Or as Peterson in, in the message paraphrases, he will convince parents to look after their children and children to look up to their parents. And so there is a thing of attitude, if you like, which has been fine-tuned where we come together in respect and in love with the values that we have and hold. And these are the things that are being passed between the generation. And so in my mind, my mind's been returning frequently to nurturing and equipping the emerging generation of GCI youngsters in the wonderful truths we have through God's grace and launching them into the missional work of the church as we in our day were before them. Didn't Jesus tell his parents when they found him in the temple, I must be about my father's business? How much more then should we be active in this area, we who know his wishes, and who ourselves signed up years ago saying, yes, Lord, we will go and work in your field. May God richly bless us in doing his will, in blessing the next generation, and may he bring to fruition all the good things we hope for and that our faith stimulates us towards doing. Can it be 
that I should gain an interest in the Savior's blood. Tidy for me, who caused his pain for me, who am to death pursued. Amazing love, how can it? How can it be that thou, my God, should die for me? He let his father's throne above so free to and that his grace emptied himself of all but love and bled for Adam's helpless race. Tis mercy all even time free for oh my God it found help me How can it be that thou, my God, should die for me? No condemnation now I dread, Jesus and all. Righteousness divine, bold I approach the eternal throne and claim the crown through Christ my own. Amazing love, how can it be that thou, my God, should die for? Hello again, everyone. Welcome to uh, this time of um, looking at God's word and in particular, um, looking at something that Paul wrote many years ago, and it's one of his deepest writings. He wrote to the Romans. He had not visited them, but he wrote to them. And he was basically outlining the requirements if you'd be a Christian. Now, if you've ever had conflict, you'll notice that there's always two sides to a conflict. And both, each side is trying to win. Now, I'm going to read for you something that Paul highlights in his own life. And it's in Romans chapter 7, and starting in verse 15. He says, I do not understand what I do. Now, if you heard that someone say that I do not understand what I do, especially an adult, you'd probably wonder, wouldn't you? What's wrong with you? You know, are you still a baby or something like that? But here's Paul, who'd... Um, followed Christ for a long time, and yet, yet he writes, I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. 
As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is sin living in me. For I know that the good inside, and the good itself does not dwell in me. That is, in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. Verse 19. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is sin living in me that does it. Now, most of you, like me, when you st start hearing that or reading that, you'll probably get turned off because you start to wonder, what's he getting at? Why is he backwards and forwards saying the same thing? And now I felt like that for years. Every time that scripture was read, I sort of almost turn off. But what is Paul getting at? Well, essentially what he's doing here, he's repeating the same ideas three points, three times. First, he acknowledges his own sinfulness. Second, he confirms this knowledge by his actions. And third, he draws a conclusion from these two observations. Let's have a closer look at what he was actually saying. He says, I do not understand what I do. And the first thing he says, what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. What did Paul want to do? Well, in verse 18, it says, I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. So that's what he wanted to do, to do, to do what is good. And we'll learn later that that good is following God and obeying God. And in verse 19, the same idea, but I do not do the good I want to do. That's what he wanted to do. Why can Paul, why, did, why does he say, I cannot carry it out? I can't do what I want to do. In verse 17, he identifies the reason. He says, it is no longer I myself who do it. And that's why he says, for well, no, someone else to blame, as it were. But Paul is clearly saying, it's not me who do it, but it is sin living in me. The sinner in me is doing. For I know that good itself, that good itself does not dwell in me. So he acknowledges that there is sin. And the sin he identifies as my sinful nature. And that is the, the, the kind of conflict I think we all experience in our journey as a Christian. When I was first baptized, all I remember is going to the pool, waiting for a minister or designated body, and being asked something like, you know, have I repented of my sins? and um, accepted Jesus as my saviour. And that was essentially it. And I said, I do. But I really struggle with the fact that I didn't feel I had sinned very much at all. Why do I need someone to die for me? So that was my level of understanding, but I knew it was part of the course. I needed to get baptised to signify that I was, I, my old self died to um, you know, in accepting Christ when he died and I got baptized and buried in the water, it was essentially symbolizing that I was willing to die in terms of my old self. But life isn't like that, is it? When someone begins his Christian walk, he views it almost like a TV show where they do a the renovation of a dilapidated house in 60 minutes. And it seems, hey, that's pretty good. And in many ways, when we enter our Christian walk, 
We have no idea what's involved. We hope that life would be better. We hope the path would be easy. I certainly did. And it's like, you know, some people have sort of likened it to the fact that when we first accept Jesus, it's like a honeymoon period. And in the honeymoon period, you're excited. There's a lot of things that's happening. It's fun. Um, and, but it isn't normal. So you have this honeymoon period where you accept Jesus. And then, as they say, life kicks in. <laughs> Reality kicks in. And you realize that, hello, you know, the honeymoon, that, that time is over. Now we've got to deal with the reality of making this marriage work. And that, in fact, is what actually happens when we become a Christian. So when Paul was saying here that sin is living in me, what he's saying is that when he accepted Jesus as his saviour, he knew that Christ had died to forgive his sins. He knew that any sins he had, had already been dealt with, had been forgiven. But the reality was, while sin was forgiven, the sin machine was still present in his body, as it is with each one of us. We say, I accept Jesus Christ. Thank you for forgiving my sins. But we so easily forget that the sin machine, our human nature, is still present. And with the right conditions, that machine will start coming to life. It's, just, it's the machine that we were born with. It's the way we work. And when Jesus uh, forgave us, that did not destroy the machine. He gives us that freedom, the freedom to keep using that machine. But on top of that, and we can read that, really highlight it in, in um, verse 21 and verse 22 in um, Romans 7 there. So I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. Verse 22, for in my inner being, I delight in God's law but I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. So he repeats that, that there's, there's a battle going on. Him, that self, versus God. And verse 24, what a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? And the answer, verse 25, thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ. So Paul recognized there was an answer, and that was in accepting Jesus. But in accepting Jesus, that is just forgiveness of our sins. Jesus left with us the inherent us, our human nature. Because for him to destroy our human nature, he would really be destroying us. So when Jesus, when we accept Jesus, we're really given another choice. A choice to choose now another means of living. We either follow our old self or we follow Jesus. There's that choice we did not have before we became a Christian. And that human nature still wants to exert itself, and it will. All you have to think about is, if someone slapped you, your mind knows, don't hit them back. But what's your human nature saying? Hit them back, hit them back harder. Hit him back twice. Isn't that, that's the law that still dwells in our, in our flesh. It's not that we deliberately want to, but that's the way we are. 
We want to fight back. We want retaliation. We want revenge. We want punishment. And in our eyes, we want justice. But it's our kind of justice. And so when we become a Christian, the challenges have not begun. In fact, the battle with our human nature actually starts to kick in. When someone doesn't believe in God, you know, there's no battle. Why? Because there's no standards. It's, un, you know, as Paul uh, has mentioned in his writing, that, you know, it was the law that showed him what's wrong, what sin was. But before the law, there was no sin. And that's why people who don't want to know God, for some of them, they don't want to know God because, hello, once I know what I'm supposed to do, there's something in my mind saying, maybe I should deal with it. But if I don't know about it, I can just keep doing what I want. Isn't that so nice? And people, we're all human. We have a tendency to do that. So, but once we are actually baptized, we've given God's spirit, we have that power, the access to that resource to help us continue living to serve God. But it is a choice. And how often and how will we make that choice depends on us. I had Peter read uh, out of uh, Matthew chapter 6, where it talks about where your treasure is. Where is our treasure is the question we need to ask. What is important for us? Because we are treasurers, there will your heart be also. If our mind is set on God, wanting to do what God wants us to do, then, and that becomes our treasure, then we will really make efforts to try and follow him. Now, when we say, Yes, we need to obey God. That doesn't, that's not an automatic thing. We can say lots of things. I'm a Christian. I want to be a Christian. That does not make me a Christian. It needs work. It needs conscious effort, deliberate action, and it needs it one step at a time. Oftentimes, you know, we get, we sort of imagine things would be, um, so easy and we forget there are lots of little steps we had some family members around last night and um, my daughter-in-law was telling me that she was out recently with a group of um, uh, women and in their conversation they were just sharing information about the family and um, uh, one of her, her friends in that in that uh, outing asked her she said oh you've got four children i've only got two how do you manage that how do you cope with four i've got two i'm thinking about having number three what's the magic almost that she was asking and my daughter-in-law pondered for a moment said and said you know what? It's one child at a time. It is one step at a time. It is one day at a time. And she was highlighting, in fact, you know, the reality. There's no magic formula that moves you from this point to that. You're going to be able to cope with children. It's three children versus two. You do what you need to do one day at a time and that's like us winning the battle against the sin our human nature how do we do it not going to happen overnight that's where the struggle is it's the fact that every day every situation consciously or unconsciously we have to make a choice do i do this way you know, like you can imagine, you see someone um, and they something they're doing 
and uh, they're getting lots of money for doing it. And you say, well, you know, I wouldn't mind a bit more money like that. It's not particularly wrong. No one really will know about it. So our human nature says, hey, why not? Why not? Why can't I be in part of the action? And the same goes with so many things that we have to consider every day. We have to ask ourselves, what does God say? What does God want me to do? And we have to consciously choose to follow God. But, you know, there's one other thing that we were given, not only freedom from past sins. When we accepted Jesus, we were given a tool there that will beat our human nature. And that tool was God's Holy Spirit, a spirit of power and the spirit that works against the flesh. And it's a spirit that is, will overpower the flesh. There are many analogies that have been given about our flesh and our mind, or flesh and spirit. And one of those that I really particularly like is, think of our human nature as being the reigning champion of the world in boxing. So they already hold the title. They've already got the skills. They know what to do. And then you have this new boy on the block. God's spirit and he's going to take on this reigning champion the reigning champion has already worked out how to normally overcome opponents he's looked at their weaknesses he knows exactly what they do he's studied them very carefully and he knows when to put you know pack in his punches so yeah I like the analogy because Here's God's spirit in your life trying to overcome the reigning champion, your human nature. How does he do that? Well, we know he could probably do a, a knockout punch, but that's not how it works, is it? It's little punches. And every time we make a decision, we have to make a decision. It is, do I follow the reigning champion of human nature, or do I choose this other way? It's harder, but I know it's the right way. Rather than just following what we tend to do naturally. So as Paul was saying, he found it really hard. He said, I don't understand. And what he was getting at is the fact that in his body there was still his human nature when he accepted jesus accepted the sacrifice of god he was forgiven those sins but his human nature was still there and that human nature is there to taunt him if you like the human nature is there to um take advantage of him some people have used the analogy analogy which i think is quite good of our human nature is like a stealth uh, soldier he often attacks when we don't expect it like our human nature we do things we don't even know it and then we've done it we've made a decision we slapped someone's face and we didn't even know it i was reminded of that very recently in at school, I was just helping a student. They were in a group of boys. I was helping the student and saying, look, you know, this is what you need to do. And then in sort of, in my mind, in jest, I sort of pointed to two boys over opposite them. I said, look, don't, you know, I said, you work hard. Don't be like these two. And wow, when I said that, the reaction from one of the students, and we're talking about these uh, 17, 18 year old students, one of them said, 
what? I've done more work than anyone on this table. And, and he said, go away. I don't want to talk to you. I was so shocked, you know. Uh, I had the kind of response, but it reminded me because I, I felt bad about the whole thing. But I knew I had to do something. And I, at the end of the period, I just called up and I said, look, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to offend you. But it was just the fact that, you know, we sometimes follow our human nature. I didn't deliberately set out to, to, to offend him. It was just, I thought it was, you know, in, in jest. But when he reacted, whoa, it brought me back to reality. I thought, well, okay, maybe I shouldn't use, uh, I'd be more careful next time about uh, teasing someone. But that's our human nature. We do things according to you know, the way we've always done it, which is our human nature. It takes time. It takes time to become like Christ. That is the point Paul is talking about. It is by the Spirit. And just to help us appreciate that, in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 16 to 17, it says, so I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. So there's that, the answer that I've been highlighting. If you want to beat the reigning champion, that's the human nature, you walk by the Spirit. In other words, you allow that Spirit to guide you. Walk by the Spirit. It's, it's saying, let the Spirit take the lead. And that's what we're doing when we say, when we commit our, our um, concerns to God, we, we're asking God to intervene in our lives. So, so I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Verse 17, the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, with each other so that, you are not to do whatever you want. And that's our walk, isn't it? We don't keep feeding me, 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 human nature. We try harder to please God, to follow God's ways. You know, I'm reminded of a something I read about Hudson Taylor, who was a famous missionary. And there was an incident where he received word one day of rioting near one of the inland mission stations. In a few moments after he was told that, there was one of his evangelists working there. I overheard Hudson Taylor whistling his favorite hymn. And the hymn was, Jesus, I am resting, resting in the joy of what thou art. Hudson Taylor had learned to rest in Jesus so that no matter what happened, and in this case, there was rioting, there was uh, fighting that he would have to try and deal with. But he dealt with it by, first of all, committing it to Christ by resting in Jesus. Just by doing that, he was. He knew that God will take control. He will deal with the situation. And every one of us needs to get to that step. It will take time. We're all different. We have all have different backgrounds. We all respond differently. But we need to get to that point where in our troubles, in our struggles, we're not relying on our human nature or our brilliant brains or anything like that. We are leaving it to God. We're resting in God's um, mercy, in his power, resting in Jesus. And we, we, there's much that we know about that's mentioned in the Bible about that. I'd like to just close just by looking at a couple of things. Back to verse 24. What a rich man I am. Who will rescue me? from this body that is subject to death. Paul realized that the answer to his human nature and 
his tendency to do wrong when he just follows that human nature? Um, the answer was God, God's Holy Spirit. Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ. So then I myself in my mind am a slave to God's law, but in my sinful nature, a slave to the law of sin. Jesus, I mean, Paul realized that that's an ongoing battle. In his mind, the desire to please God, the desire to follow God and do things that God wants him to, that is in his mind. But also realize that in his human nature, he would follow the law of sin. He would be subject to it because his, his flesh would tell him, do this, you can get away with this. No one will know. And I'd just like to close one a last illustration of this. Recently, again at school, a student told me that he was concerned about one of the teachers or the, the senior teachers chasing him out up and taking him off a particular class, which was uh, outdoor education. And I said, why? And he said, well, look, you know, we were recently on a outdoor education tramp and some of us went for a swim. And, um, but nothing happened. It was hot. We checked it out that the, the pool wasn't too deep. So we went for a swim. And then the teacher found out and the teacher became angry. And this boy is trying to tell me that. But we didn't do anything wrong. And the way he justified was, I thought was so funny. He said, look, nothing happened. Look, I've still got my two hands and my feet. Nothing happened. So I don't understand why the teacher was jumping up and down. So I simply said, have you thought about the what if? What if something did? But nothing did. You know, so let's suppose for a moment something did. What do you think? And your parents heard that something had happened to you. What do you think your parents will say? Well, they will blame the school. Yes, I said they will. But nothing happened to us. We checked it out. And his argument reminded me so much of the way as human beings we can be. We're always ready to justify self. Always a good reason. I've still got my hands and my feet. What did I do wrong? God doesn't want us to argue that kind of, um, in that way, because he knows no matter how good we are, we can't be righteous in his sight. We have to take on God's spirit. We have to trust him. That way we can become transformed. That way we know that we are delivered. That way we win the internal battle against our other self. Thank you. Just prior to the um, closing prayer, we've just had a prayer request come through. Uh, William Trevathan's sister, Gail, in Florida, a few weeks ago, her husband was diagnosed with stage four cancer and just a week ago, he passed away. So the funeral was held yesterday with full military honors as he was a Colonel in the US Army. But Gail needs our prayers um, to get over this terrible, tragic situation. They had just started their retirement together and this has happened. So uh, let's pray. Father in heaven, we do come to you as a group and we do pray now for William's sister, Gail, at this tragic time for her. We pray for your comfort and encouragement 
that can only come miraculously for you from you in a situation like this, but that you'll encourage and comfort her at this time. And also we do remember Nsama, the wife of uh, KK, a superintendent in Africa, who has a serious health issue that we've just heard about today. So we just pray, Father, that she will put her trust in you and uh, that you'll remember her and comfort her and heal her at this time. There are so many people suffering in the world today. All we can do is just ask for your help, how badly the world needs you at this time, how badly we need your kingdom, and we just pray for your kingdom to come. Thank you, Father, for the opportunity to meet in this way that we have done today to worship you. We do appreciate the messages we've heard. We appreciate your love for us as your people. And we realize that as Paul did and told us about in the book of Romans that uh, we are very sinful. We always remember our sinfulness. We have a constant struggle in life as we want to follow you in everything, but we slip up so often because our human nature is constantly with us. So Father, help us to yield to the direction of your wonderful Holy Spirit. Allow your Holy Spirit to guide us to make the right choices in life, one by one, as we do that on into the future. Thank you so much, Father, for the sacrifice of Jesus and for the guidance of our Comforter, the Holy Spirit so that we can have the victory over sin. Thank you for reminding us of that today. We pray for your blessing then as we go forward, for your guidance and help, for your spirit to be with us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Just to conclude the service with a benediction, uh, David's been reading from the book of Romans today and Towards the end of Romans, we read this wonderful uh, phrase here. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.